Well, thank you all for coming uh, this morning and for coming out to one of our city's facilities. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging the folks who are here with us today. Uh, we have our interim director of animal welfare, John Soliday. We also have uh, Vicki Fisher from Kennel Compadres and Lawrence Rael, our city's uh, COO. And we've got a lot of folks from our partner organizations here, from Animal Humane and Animal Protection, I think, and so we appreciate them being here as well. And you know, one of the things that uh, folks tend to forget is, of course, for our pets, there are no political boundaries or distinctions between nonprofits and governments. And so uh, we want to continue to work together with all our partners, and we appreciate them being here today. Now, um, a couple of things that we're going to share. First, I want to express, express my gratitude for all the work of John Soliday. Uh, and that he's done so far to maintain and enhance our city's animal welfare department. And you know, for those of you who don't know, when I came into office, I was aware or I had heard about several challenges with respect to this department. And so one of the first things I did was bring in new management, management that was very, very experienced. And for folks who are unaware, John's got 43 years of experience in municipal government. And uh, he was the sustainability officer under Marty Chavez. He was the director of both environmental health and solid waste under Mayor Barry. I think he was also COO for a while. So uh, we were really glad that he was actually willing, because this is something he didn't really have to do, that he was willing to come in and sort of um, assess the situation and make some of the big changes early that we need to do while we progress with the national search, which is still ongoing. Now, he took a lot of responsibility. He took on a lot uh, to help us with the number of concerns in the department. And uh, these concerns, some of these we're going to talk about here today. But he moved quickly to implement some changes and has been putting us on a right track, a track that is based on responsibility and transparency and accountability and care for our pets and to help find sustainable homes for them. So today I want to reiterate our commitment to all of Albuquerque's pets and uh, also to thank John for his help in working to ensure that all of our employees from top to bottom, from volunteers to professionals, are continuing to operate with the utmost level of professionalism and care for our pets. We owe it not only to Albuquerque residents, but also to our volunteers and our partners with us today and uh, to everyone in Albuquerque to give the pets the best care the city can provide. Now, um, we've made some strides in this area and I do think we've also seen the morale of folks involved with our department and with uh, Pet Care and Animal Humane also improved uh, in the spirit of actually getting down to the bottom of some of these long-standing issues that I think we've all heard about and trying to understand what the reality is, what the myths are, etc. And so um, we need to have a better understanding of euthanasia rates in order to take the necessary steps to reduce how often we have to euthanize a pet and that is a strong commitment that we continue to have. We are also committed to a no-kill policy which uh, folks can go into the math but it's roughly 10 percent. No-kill is actually not a literal definition it's a policy and it's something we're very much committed to. But how we achieve that, how we continue it, uh, matters a lot and that's what we're going to discuss a little bit today. So that basically means that our goal of finding homes for at least 90% of our pets who come through the doors uh, with uh, respect to doing that in a way that has integrity and also transparency. Now, one of the ways that we do that is to improve our spay neuter programs to ensure that our residents uh, who may need help affording these procedures have access to these critical services for their pets. And this goes by far and away the longest way to also preventing overcrowding in our kennels. And so this continues to be a top priority uh, for our department. So we also are taking steps to end breed discrimination, something I actually worked on in the state legislature and our city is also committed to. And so <clears throat> as we take these steps to gain control, hopefully in some ways, of our pet population in Albuquerque, uh, we need to continue to face these challenges head on. And part of that means acknowledging a couple of things that have gone on. And we're going to talk about some of this in detail uh, with the, the speakers who are going to come up next. But number one, the, the math and the numbers behind the no-kill policy, um, they have been heavily massaged in the past. 
and uh, we do not have a lot of confidence in what has been shared in terms of gains or losses with respect to our no-kill percentage. And so we are committed to the philosophy, we are committed to making it real, but we've got to get a uniform way of counting that so that it's not gamed. And frankly, in the past it was. And so that's something we're gonna fix going forward. The second thing is, uh, one of the ways you can help achieve no-kill policy is to essentially send animals to other shelters. And as folks have heard, we currently have some senior officials, or at least one, under investigation who's now on administrative leave uh, because of inappropriate transport of animals. Uh, we'll see where this investigation goes in terms of the legality, uh, but we know conceptually it was wrong and we know it was inappropriate and that practice has been stopped and that individual will be held accountable. With respect to if there's any associated charges or anything like that, we're going to have to let the investigation process and the legal process play out. But that in no way was a reflection of the frontline workers here at the city of Albuquerque and it was also in no way a reflection of the volunteers who put in a ton of hours helping our shelters. But it was a reflection of leadership and it was a reflection of a lack of integrity at the top and I'm pleased to say that we have new leadership uh, in those areas where that was happening. So to shed a little bit more light on this and talk about some of the details and the status of our shelters right now, I want to introduce uh, John Soliday, our Interim Director of Animal Welfare. John. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is to take a minute and just thank the great workers of the Animal Welfare Department. Um, this department will process more than 16,000 pets through um, intake and um, out to adoption. It's a huge undertaking and our folks do it so very professionally with so much compassion and care. And um, if you have an opportunity to talk to them for just a few minutes, you pick up really quickly their passion for what they do. It's really important to the success of this organization that that compassion stay connected um, through a po appropriate policy and procedure, uh, appropriate training, and clear and concise guidance and leadership. Um, they, they've asked me to run through a few points here. Uh, one of them I'd like to talk a little bit about the numbers and, and concentrating on euthanasia. Um, I, euthanasia and the numbers and how we record that are really important factors in managing um, a shelter like this. But I think even more important is the capacity for care and the amount of time animals spend in our care. Um, the, the true consideration in this, especially now, is how quickly can we move animals through and how well can we manage those animals while they're in our possession. Um, each of these um, are somebody's pet, uh, hopefully, um, and the quicker, the more efficient uh, we can be in processing pets through our facilities, um, the less stress on the pet and the more happy families out there because they have one of our, one of our pets. Um, like the mayor said, um, there are uh, significant opportunities here to improve not only the way we process, but how we track, manage, and, and make decisions. And um, our staff here are very professional, uh, years and years of experience, both in the vet area, in our kennel, uh, our intake people, um, and our field services officers. And they make judgment calls every day that directly impact animal welfare or, or humane treatment of animals. Um, we need to rely on that expertise in moving forward and ensure that they have the tools and the resources to make good decisions. Um, um, like the mayor said, we have worked through a number of personnel issues here and will continue um, to do the right thing when it comes to personnel. Um, the key is ensuring that we're firm, fair, and consistent about the rules uh, that we put in place. We're currently in the process of reviewing policies and procedures. Um, all of our staff will be retrained on those. Um, and that's the key framework under which we operate and need to operate into the future. With those tools, our staff can be successful and the mission of, of the uh, shelter can be successful. Um, the 
last point in my short list here has to do with field services officers. You know, our field services division has suffered um, a large number of vacancies and as a result we've had a significant backlog of calls. Um, we're <laughs> frantically recruiting. Um, we, we've um, uh, had that process going for a few months now. Um, we have the first four officers coming on board uh, to fill the six vacancies we have and are hopeful to be interviewing and filling the rest. In the meantime, we've put additional resource in the division to help us clear the backlog of calls and to expeditiously get to calls um, and, and respond to our constituents um, in an appropriate fashion. So with that, I'd like to hand off to Vicki Fisher with Kennel Compadre. Thank you, John. Morning, everyone. Kennel Compadres is going on, uh, I think, probably about 14 years now. And as such, we've been in the enviable position, I guess, if you will, of seeing all of the wonderful things that have happened here over the years. There have been so many improvements. Every mayor, every director has brought something new to this department, uh, left with, uh, with ratcheting up the expectations of all of us on how this community treats its pets. And I want to congratulate um, Mayor Keller and also thank him for his commitment, obviously, to, uh, to continuing on with, with um, uh, making this one of the best, actually the best, um, animal welfare departments in the, in the United States. Kennel Compadres has filled a little bit of a gap over the years. Um, we are in the position of being able to um, help those in the community who have a passion, if you will, uh, for taking care of animals, for their welfare. Our donations stay with the shelter entirely. So as we have people donate to us, all of that money stays here at the shelter. You'll find that um, if you look through the kennels, I assume they're here, so the beds that are in the kennels here, we just purchased. Uh, we buy a lot of enrichment things for the animals. We buy lots of toys. Uh, once upon a time, we, we did buy the peanut butter. Now it kind of magically appears. Uh, a lot of the volunteers uh, bring in a number of things for the animals. We buy treats. At one point, one of the enrichment ideas was to perfume the kennels with, uh, with essential oils, and we, I got to be an expert on buying essential oils. But just to say that, you know, our role has been to take the, the passion and the good work of the marvelous staff here, um, and the passion and excitement of a very, very thriving volunteer group and being able to help them realize what's best for the animals. We have, we have been very, very successful in, in spay neuter. We've spent between uh, 50 to 70 some odd thousand dollars a year from Kennel Compadres to basically supplement um, a low cost spay neuter program. And that's in addition to all the other wonderful, wonderful projects that we have been very, very happy to support here at the shelter. So our role again um, is to match up the passion of our community and the passion of our volunteers and our staff to make a better world for our animals here in Albuquerque. <coughs> Thank you, Vicki. And uh, I would just say that Kennel Compadres is but one of the many organizations that really supports and helps this this department do its work. And I, um, and I applaud all of the volunteers and others who come every day to help walk the dogs, to exercise the animals, et cetera, and provide the care that they need. But again, as the mayor said, the most important piece for us is ensuring that we expedite the exit of these animals out of this facility into the hands of children and families across Albuquerque, quite frankly, across the state. And as a result of that, looking at how we manage our euthanasia policy so that we can have the lowest kill rate possible is extremely important in a policy that the mayor has uh, directed this department to, to, to uh, establish and follow through. The other piece I want to also say is what Vicki touched on, that is that the spade and neuter program is really 
a very successful program that was established many years ago and continues to be a great way for us to ensure that the animals that we uh, get into the shelter are spayed and neutered so that, that way we don't have this issue consistently of the growing population uh, that obviously begins to become a challenge for the department, especially as we look at the resources and look at the, shelter, the, the number of kennels that we have and the number of animals that have been here for longer than we would like. So those are the kinds of policies, et cetera, that we're working on. John has done a tremendous job of just looking at the whole organization from top to bottom, working with the various different groups, whether it's the vets who do the work um, uh, of spade and neuter work, et cetera, and caring for the animals and their health, to working with our, our field personnel and working with the folks that actually manage the facilities every day here. So again, we encourage all of our citizens in Albuquerque to come look at the animals. If you're looking to adopt an animal, We've got lots of animals that really need a home and uh, really could use a smiling face every day. So with that being said, um, thank you. And I think, May, I'll turn it back over to you. OK. Um, OK, well, we're, we are available for some questions. Uh, so we can take those uh, kind of one at a time. And I uh, want to thank John and Nicole, uh, along with all their colleagues and the folks who came here uh, today as well. And uh, you know, as we have shared, uh, and we can go in if folks have questions. But um, you know, uh, the capacity management program that was mentioned in terms of animals in over 90 days and so forth. Um, this is uh, when you have a situation where there's lots of pressure for a no-kill policy, and that can lead to um, you know uh, folks massaging the numbers. It can lead to folks trying to send these animals elsewhere, perhaps inappropriately, and it can also lead to animals sitting here too long. And so all of those are interrelated. Uh, and right now, they, in the recent uh, past, have all been a problem. But I do want to emphasize what, um, uh, what uh, John and Nicole said, that by, by, uh, by and large, this department has always been a shining star for Albuquerque. And going back to even when I was a kid, I was looking at the different names on here and things. And, but uh, this department in general is one of the better departments in the country and always has been. But I will tell you this, in the last few years, we lost our way a little bit. And that's what we're going to fix going forward. Questions? How are we ensuring dangerous dogs are not adopted out of the population? Great question. That one's fairly technical. So I'm going to check with one of our technical folks on that. Um, the, the clearing process and the assessment process that our vets and our animal handlers and, and our behavioralists do um, are all geared towards ensuring that the animals that are up for adoptable, considered fully adoptable, meet the appropriate criteria and aren't dangerous to go out. What, what, what would that criteria be? Uh, I'm the sorry. criteria to determine if an animal is dangerous. Ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry, what, I can't. What's the criteria to determine if It's okay. I, I can't hear. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. That's okay. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so the question was about what's the criteria for that. And I do know, um, you know, for a number of reasons, too, we have obviously vets you can direct that to. If you don't mind, because they prefer to just not be on camera. So if you don't mind, you can ask them. We'll get you that answer, but they, that we can answer that. So you have the answer, but they don't want to. They weren't comfortable being on camera, which is their choice. So let's let a vet answer your question. When you talked about kind of massaging the numbers, can you give us an idea of what <coughs> the reported euthanasia rates were compared to what they actually were? Well, and this is something as state auditor, we I'm very familiar with sort of seeing this. Uh, you can report these numbers kind of in any way you want. So like if you look at month to month comparisons, it tells one story. If you compare one month last year to the same month the year before, that can also tell you a different story. And basically, uh, in general, there was just selective usage of how they were presenting those so that it painted the best picture. And uh, what we need to get is a consistent methodology for measuring that. Uh, and then we, it's, it's sort of like the agreed upon starting line, and then we work on that and try and maintain that. They never did that. So basically, the calculation for no kill could be different depending on who asked or when they asked, and they would provide a number that made the department look good. That was basically what was happening. Do you have any numbers that you can give us an idea of where that? So all the numbers are uh, public, and they're published each month. I think they're at least on our website. We can also get you those. But again, until we agree on a consistent way to present those, I don't put a lot of credence in those. What numbers are you looking for to be successful? What, what are your goals, I guess, in this? 
Yeah, we want to be you know below ten percent in terms of uh, uh, euthanasia. That's that's the goal. The question is how we calculate that. And what we want to do is actually work with our partners to kind of get an agreed upon public way to calculate that. Uh, this problem actually occurs in all sorts of areas, like how you calculate minimum wage, how you calculate consumer price index. Um, but until you have a like, okay, here's the formula we're using, and we're going to do that going forward, um, you can continue to manipulate that formula to get the answer you want. So we're going to use our partners and folks who've done this a long time, and also look at some national models, and basically pick a method and go with it. Did those inappropriate transports, um, did that involve potentially dangerous dogs, or was that just like a, the proper paperwork wasn't filled out, or can you go into any... Yeah, so there's some that I can share. Uh, basically, there was a relationship between some senior staff members and a uh, outfit in Colorado, a uh, financial relationship there. And uh, those animals uh, were being sent from New Mexico to that uh, those organizations in Colorado. Uh, there was money involved, and so that's why we also want to be very careful and, and know whether or not that uh, those cost figures were appropriate. They may have been, they may not have been. And um, to our knowledge, it was a mix of um, you know, animals that were difficult to adopt and some that seem seemingly were very adoptable. And you can see in terms of financial incentives why that would be the case. Uh, either way, the way it was done is totally inappropriate. You can't have city management selling animals to their own company. On any given year, there's 1,400 dogs adopted out to various nonprofits all over New Mexico. So how are we ensuring that dangerous dogs are not being given past the trash given to these nonprofits that are potentially dangerous? Well, uh, the first step was clamping down on what I just described. And uh, the we're following a process that the city has used for a long time from a veterinary perspective on that. Uh, but the third thing is uh, the audit, which I'm sure many of you saw, I think it was either last year or the beginning of, yeah, it was, I think it was the beginning of last year. Uh, we actually did an internal audit identifying all of this and diagnosing those issues. Um, I do believe after that came out, that's when all these processes were codified. So we should be caught up with respect to the recommendations and finding in that audit. Other questions? How do we go forward? How do we, are we looking for a new associate director? What policies are changing to ensure this doesn't happen again? So number one is uh, the individuals who used to be leading the department are now no longer leading the department. That is a big step in terms of changing direction. Uh, our interim management is working on policies so that this department is governed by policies that are transparent and we can hold leaders accountable to instead of by the opinion or whim of whoever is in charge. The third thing is we're conducting our national search. Uh, we did get a lot of candidates. Uh, we're going through those now and uh, we want to bring in, I think we are committed to bringing in someone uh, who has at least experience running organizations like this. It doesn't necessarily have to be an animal type organization, but maybe it will. But we want to make sure that we have somebody who is, um, has not had sort of ties to some of these issues in the past that we spoke about. Based on the outcome of the investigation, are you going to pursue charges? Or are you in favor of pushing for those charges for the leader? We'll have to see on the, the investigation. And you know, I just want to remind folks that um, the uh, city personnel code and other rules basically state that you know a mayor can't just walk in and let certain people go. Uh, so they're put on administrative leave until there is determination whether or not there's justification for further action. So um, to follow our own personnel policy, that's about all I can say at this point.